With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here as in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. See, the show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Before we get going today, I want to share that our guest, Dub Maddox, with his R4, has partnered with Modern Football Technology and Union High School has become a customer. We'll talk about analytics in this episode, and modern football technology provides a powerful platform for utilizing analytics to create frameworks for game planning and decision making prior to a game, as well as play calling and adjustments during a game. To learn more about this powerful tool, go to teammofo.com. The link is in the show notes. In the military, that's what you have to do. When you're taking over an enemy territory, you have to know where the weak points are and you have to quickly establish those footholds and not try to run into a brick wall. You know, I think there's a great quote in the Art of War, do not besiege walled cities if it can be avoided. You know, you don't want to run into the strengths of the defense. You want to establish those footholds quickly and making sure you're hammering them and keep calling it until they stop it and you adjust and, and go elsewhere. Union High School Offensive Coordinator and the creator of R4, joins us today to discuss the challenges and strategies involved in becoming a successful play caller. From learning through failures to leveraging analytics, Coach Maddox shares valuable insights and practical tips for honing your play calling skills. We uncover the key traits of top play callers, the role of analytics in decision making, and the unique R4 framework for enhancing play calling efficiency. Plus, discover what you can expect from Dub's comprehensive course, The Art of Play Calling, designed to elevate your understanding and execution of play calling in the game of football. The link to his course is in the show notes. Support for this episode comes from Modern Football Technology. Modern Football Technology provides real-time opponent tendencies and self-scout while eliminating manual data entry into Huddle, DV Sport, and Exos. If you're tired of tools that are time-consuming to learn and perform inconsistently at best, then we recommend Modern Football for a fresh perspective. Schedule a demo today at teammofo.com to see a battle-tested tool that's proven to perform and deliver value. Mention Coach and Coordinator Podcast or use the coupon code CC10 to receive 10% off your first year. And listen to our recent episode featuring Folsom High School Defensive Coordinator Jordan Ersick to learn more about how the 2023 California State Champion uses modern football to dominate their opponents. On today's podcast, we're going to focus on the art of play calling and start with a challenge, a question. Where do you go to learn how to be a play caller? And that's one, not even an easy question to answer and where do you go. But then when you figure some of those things out, how do you sculpt that into a framework for yourself to become a play caller? And joining us is Dub Maddox, the offensive coordinator at Union High School. He's created a course called The Art of Play Calling. And we'll get into how you can learn more about that and what's in it as we head towards the end of the podcast. But Dub, always great to talk ball with you. I think the last time we talked, we were, we were talking about poker. Yes, that's right. Um, we we did a deep dive on the uh, analogies of poker and calling plays and, and designing uh, you know offense and and I think you know we're going to come in at a different perspective here and with the art of play calling and excited to to dive in. Yeah, definitely. And I, I pose that question: Where do you go to learn to be a play caller? 
Because we could go to clinics and, and learn all kinds of stuff. We can learn all these schemes, even learn some strategy behind it. But ultimately, it's going to come down to you on game day making those decisions at the right time, using the right information. And that's kind of been the framework for you as you've put this together. Yeah, it's been my my struggle uh, for many years. I just finished my 15th year as a play caller and made a ton of mistakes. And I'm always every year looking ways to to get better, improve. Where do you go to learn a better process, a better framework? And, you know, we go to clinics, we get on online now and we watch videos. And I think the challenge for me is you can only learn through failure. And I think the biggest roadblock to break through is finding really good play callers that are willing to talk through about their mistakes and how they they fix them and the process they use to to make sure they don't recreate those again. And if I go to, you know, if I go to a power five offensive coordinator or a clinic, most of those guys who don't even know me aren't going to, you know, unpack those, those, those insecurities or those, those mistakes. And so I think that's the biggest challenge. So how do you work around that? Um, One of the things that we dive into the course is the advent of analytics, the availability of analytics, I think is, has been helpful for me. Um, because now we can use data to kind of drive uh, our decisions and use it as a, a framework to kind of overlay uh, play calling and understand, okay, was that the best you know call to make in that situation? And then we also have more access to film now. So through analytics and film, you just kind of have to watch the most successful teams. And really, for me, one of the th- ways I found to thin slice that process was I, I do a, a big study on opening drives. And so there's so much film to watch these days. There's so many good play callers out there. How, how do you know who they are? How do you identify them? And, and how do you break them down? I, I watch the opening drives, and there's an analytic out there that says if you score a touchdown on the opening drive, you have a 70% win rate uh, for that game. And if you do not score a touchdown in the opening drive or zero points in the opening drive, there's only you only have a 44% win rate. So I thought that was pretty intriguing. So that led me down a rabbit hole to, to start studying opening drives. And when you study opening drives, you get a really quick feel of how good that play caller is. You know, if it's at that first third and five of the game, he's calling his best third and five. And you can see um, if he uses motions and shifts to undress the defense quickly, you can see the connectivity within play calls early. And so for me, that's been a, a way that I would recommend for you guys out there that are listening. If you want to try to ID a really good play caller, and we don't have a lot of time to sit down and watch, you know, 50 hours of game film, watch op- the opening drives of teams. And if you see a good play caller that consistently calls a good opening drive, that's might be a guy you want to take a deeper dive on. Yeah. You mentioned to me before we got going that you were able to uncover some top traits of play callers. I know that's something you go into in detail in your course, but would love for you to share some of those that I mean, really highlight this idea of the art of play calling. Yeah, the a couple there's a, there's a lot of you know a lot of things. Obviously, you got to you know get the ball in the hands of your playmakers, and I think there's some you know global traits that you know everyone understands. But for me, the number one is great play callers. When you watch their film, they really do a great job of anticipating defensive adjustments, and and they have a a really good ability to maintain patience with their play calls. Uh, they're not coming out and just you know firing all kinds of you know shots early. I mean, they they really do a good job of knowing how to what I call undress the defense. And, and so you know a lot of times you'll see, to me, in my opinion, really good play callers, especially early, they're doing a lot of shifts and motions and movements, or they're using formations that force the defenses into structural strain or, you know, what I call base, you know, coverage and front looks. And so you'll see that pattern show up a lot in really good play callers. They just do a, have, a, have a knack for anticipating those adjustments. They have patience in calling plays. And the big one, and this is seems really like a no dub, but it's they keep calling plays that work. They keep going back to the plays that work. And that's been a a one for me that I get frustrated with myself is, is you'll go back and rewatch the game and, you know, you have a really good run that's, that's cranking, you know, five, six, seven yards a clip and you go back and you ran it three times and you didn't force them to stop it. And so that's something that I always got to keep in my forefront of my brain is to, to keep going back to it 
until they stop it. And the other thing is there's connectivity within play calls. Like when you watch a good play caller, it's almost like you can, it's like reading a good story or watching a good movie. You can see how he is setting everything up and how he's adjusting and moving. And, and I think that's something that stands out. Another trait is, is they run football plays. And what do you mean? You might be saying, well, what do you mean by that? You'll see a lot of, and diving into, you know, good, a lot of NCAA film, and NFL film, you know, guys are try to get too creative and they run plays that don't have good stretches. Uh, the timing is off. The, the routes don't match up well. And I think good players, they run really sound concepts and they have creative ways to, to get there. So that's uh, some of the things that kind of just jump out if you're taking notes. For me, I think another one is they find footholds quickly. When you're watching a game, especially early, they are able to quickly identify the weak points of a defense and establish a foothold. And what I mean by that is, you know, say you've got the field flat open and they come out and they are hammering that field flat rep after rep with different maybe ways to get there. But in the military, that's what you have to do when you're taking over an enemy territory. You have to know where the weak points are and you have to quickly establish those footholds and not try to run into a brick wall. You know, I think there's a great quote in the art of war. Do not besiege walled cities if it can be avoided. You know, you don't want to run into the strengths of the defense. You want to establish those footholds quickly and making sure you're hammering them and keep calling it until they stop it. And then you adjust and, and go elsewhere. I think those things are so important to identify those traits. See where you match up as a play caller. Where are your strengths and weaknesses? And as you were, you were talking there, I uh, was reminded of an episode we did with uh, Jordan Ersick, who's going to be at, he was at El Capitan High School in California as the head coach and called the offense last year. This year, he's going to be calling the defense as a defensive coordinator at defending state champ Folsom High School in California. But he talked about the analytics tools that he's using and how they helped him. Uh, you mentioned that good play callers can anticipate adjustments that um, they can understand, like, I should keep running this play. Uh, I should run it in this situation. I think the modern tools today really allow you to do that. So it is, too, I think, as you you weave into the evolution of yourself as a coach, the analytic side, and definitely want to dig into some of the things that you've called uh, analytic probability protocols. But just in general, right, harnessing that technology, not just in your game planning, but being able to translate that some to game day, right? And being able to use tools on game day. How, how do you see that working for you as you evolve and progress here in, in the near future and beyond? Yeah, well, it, it really goes back. I mean, I've studied a lot with decision making under pressure. And this this story just is, is kind of one that stands out for me in play calling. It has to do with smoke jumpers. OK, and so you know, smoke jumpers fight wildfires out in the mountains. And so there was this one particular study they did on this unit that all, all the guys perished with, with the exception of the captain. And so what happens, these guys, you know, parachuted down trying to fight this firefighter and they were at the base of the mountain and the fire's at the base. It's working up. And and so the captain is is farther up uh, from the rest of the team, higher on the mountain. And all of a sudden the wind shifts and now the wind starts pushing the fire up the mountain very rapidly. And so the captain has to make a quick decision and he comes up with this strategy on the fly. And he takes his tools out and he starts actually starts a fire ahead of him that once he starts it, it starts to work up the mountain. So everybody down below is like, what's going on? Because this is a strategy they haven't talked about, they haven't discussed. And to that point, it never been even invented. And so what the captain was thinking is if I start this fire ahead of me, um, it's going to burn all the grass. And when the fire below catches up to that, it's going to stop. Because And so after and so the team was freaking out like okay what are you doing and he didn't have a way to communicate this you know because this was like a new strategy it was something they had not practiced and so what happened is the fire the the fire at the base overtakes the team because they have no idea what's going on they see this fire ahead of them a fire below they're starting to panic and the captain wants the fire ahead of him like kind of burns he's able to just drop down and lay down in the ashes and once the the fire at the base gets to that new fire it stops. And so to me, I was like, this is me every year in a big game. It's like, you know, my play calls are not going well. You have an injury. Um, bad things are happening. I start calling plays off the fly. And, and my my staff and the team are like, you know, they have no idea what's going on. There's no communication protocol. 
we have not practiced this and things go awry. And I think for me and with the analytics and the play calling process, when you talked about Coach Ursic's, um in his platform, I think we we as coaches have to have a, a better framework um, to get everybody aligned on, OK, our process. And we have to have you know plans for every situation. And so I think that's one of the things that the course will kind of unpack is all those critical situations that you can encounter. You you got to have, you know, at least one play that can handle those situations. And that's kind of what we dive deep to in the analytics. And I think that's what the technology that Jordan was presenting in your podcast is really going to help coaches with. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. You know, with everything, Dub, I think one of the things I've really enjoyed about, man, I met you, you were teaching quarterback mechanics, and then R4 came about, and then, you know, your different books. But there's a, a common thread in everything you do is everything is integrated, meaning that this is about not just you as the play caller, but this is the the connection with your guys out on the field who need to understand this as well. Your success on a play caller is really going to come down to how well did that translate, you know, especially to the quarterback and how he understands uh, what's going on on the field, how he understands situations, how he understands probabilities. So how does that play a part in, you know, what you've put together here as well as just in general, your thoughts on calling plays? Yeah, you know, well, there's, there's five, there's five really big, you know, pillars of, of analytics that affect winning. And there's all, all kinds of, you can get lost in the weeds on numbers, but if you look at the top five, obviously explosive and turnovers are the biggest one. And I think everyone understands those. I think you have more explosive plays in your opponent when 82% of the time, you know, you win the turnover rate, you, you win 81% of the time. Another one that was kind of big for me was sacks and, and understanding, you know, in putting the course together that the offense only has a 15% chance of a touchdown when a sack occurs on a drive. And so that was a big one for me. What that did is that helped me. I, my quarterback needs to understand the severity of a sack on a drive. And so I'm able to now show him, OK, look, here's the analytics in NCAA football of how a sack can impact, you know, a drive. You know, we have to do a better job of knowing where our hots are, how to throw the ball away, um, how to avoid pressure. And, you know, one of the biggest you know things, I have a mantra on bootlegs that I've had for years. All right. We, you never, ever, ever should have a sack on a bootleg even on naked bootleg, because you have an immediate flat, right, that is there to at least throw the ball at his feet or throw it away. I mean, we have to – we actually work on bootlegs, naked boots, you know, gaining depth out of the play fake if we feel that there's edge pressure and they didn't buy the fake, and then learning how to throw it away into the flat so we don't have that analytic overtake, you know, and, and we, we factor into that. So, again – um, teams with the most sacks win 77% of the game. So I think that was a big one for me to get my quarterback to understand those, that situational, you know, component. And I think that's what the course kind of unpacks. You know, PN10 is another big one that I think a lot of guys are becoming more understanding of the impact of PN10. But the teams with the most efficient PN10 win 76% of the games. You know, so I have to do a better job of calling and designing PN10 plays. And what does that look like? Well, I don't want to just line up and 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 run just you know standard just straight head runs. You'll see a lot of a lot of teams do that and defense is amped up, fired out first play of the drive and they're loading the box and you know I think you got to have different ways to to shift in motion and create some some ways to get the defense into more of a static look or affect their eyes to slow them down to get that 4 yards or more because if you have 
a good P and 10 efficiency, the chance of winning a game is like 88%, right? Teams that are 55% efficient on P and 10 win 88% of the time in NCAA. So again, that's another huge one that I got to do a better job of um, in our game planning process and getting our players to understand the importance of getting four yards or more on P and 10. And then the last one the, of, the, of the five pillars was a tackle for loss, TFLs, right? Offense only has a 15% chance of a touchdown when a tackle for loss occurs on a drive. Teams with the most TFLs win 67% of the game. So, again, we've got to make sure we're getting into the best play call. We are neutralizing man advantage. And so when we sit down as a staff, if, you know, we don't feel really good about this play, I mean, at a minimum, getting back to the line of scrimmage, then, you know, we, did, we need to take that out. So, again, I think highlighting these key indicators that affect winning really helps me do a better job of calling better plays and then getting my players to understand how to make better decisions to negate those deficiencies. Yeah, it really is going to be some of those things that go into the game planning too, very practice, understanding those situations. And Believe me, they're they're more and more aware of analytics on the other side of the ball. Just in you know this year, I know we had Cody Bethke on, who's defense coordinator at Co College. They led the country in tackles for loss, and he spoke at length about you know how they're game planning for those. And you know from that podcast, I had a listener, Josh Sabinas, who's a, a coach in Pennsylvania, talk about how those analytics and just trying to engineer tackle for loss really came into play in how they put their game plans together, how he thinks about calling plays, because as you said, you know, that it definitely affects the the scoring percentage of the drive, you know, a long time back, you share with me, uh, Mike Ayers study on explosive plays. Well, you know, the tackle for loss kind of works in, in the reverse of that, that uh, your team is going to struggle for success if you're allowing a lot of those tackles for loss in any single drive or over the course of a game. Yeah, it's, I mean, guys are becoming more aware. And and I think that's an even another big alarm for me to make sure we're on top of these things and and we're not, we're not missing opportunity or putting ourselves in, in a corner to take, you know, extra hits. Now I know another part of this is your R4 framework. You have these two, as you say, 10 X, the perfect play call. Uh, I know guys get excited about 10 xing anything. So how do you 10 x the perfect play call? Can you give us an example or a, an overview of something that we'd pick up here in this course? Yeah, I think you know to improve your play calling, it's it's all about limiting you know those those negatives that I talked about those five pillars. But I think really the key to 10 x your play calling is to be able to distill your game plan and your play calls and your situational play calls throughout your staff and your players. It's getting everybody aligned and everybody seeing space, time, and talent the same. And so for us, I mean, our our framework is the HALO framework we use to outline, you know, space availability, you know, know, terms like the hard deck. We have five vertical tubes that we use to process space availability, the apex lines. I think the center line is a really underutilized frame of reference. I mean, it's very important that coaches – and players understand how to use movements across that center line to, to neutralize that man advantage. And that's used heavily more in the run game. But, you know, how are you going to neutralize those players and make sure you're always in man advantage neutrality with your concept? And that's a big one. I mean, I don't want to run into boxes that have one more defender than than my blockers. And so, again, I think that's that's a critical component is to have key frames of reference that everybody is seeing space, time, and talent the same through. And then the other one is how do you link plays together, your play calls together? You know, play call sheet's a big one, Keith, for me. I mean, I've tried every year. I feel like I recreate my play call sheet and think, you know, having a good play call sheet is when you fill it in, that's really where the value of a good play call sheet is. It's in filling out the play call sheet is really how you're, you're playing the game through your mind. The best games I've called, I don't look at my play sheet other than like critical situations where it might be kind of a new play or or motion wrinkle. But there's really three ways to break a play sheet down or really to to, um, break plays down on a play call sheet. One is by formation. And and so I think, you know, I think it's important to have, you know, all your play calls, you know, strung together within a formation in kind of an if-then process, kind of a wing T style. But I find I, I also need another filter to look plays through whether it's in game or whether it's during the week, and that's through classification. Um, I think you know there's there's 
you know, if I if where's all my inside side zone plays, my all my my gap schemes, I, I want those grouped into Pacific section on my play call sheet because there's certain times in the game where I just know I want to throw a screen. All right. So I, I need I want to see okay, what screens do we have at our disposal that we've repped or we're good at? So I think that's another thing you want to have on your play call sheet is plays grouped by classification. And then the third one is situation. I mean, you need to have another filter a way to filter all these play call informations in so you can organize kind of, you know, what the best ones would be in, in, in those areas. And so I think situational is also a critical one. You know, what, where's my third and shorts going to be? Where's my PN 10 plays? Where's my, you know, red zone, high red, low red, tight, however you organize it up. So I think structuring your play sheet to have a kind of a distillation process with these filters, doing it by formation, classification, and situation has really helped me see the signal through the noise and distill all out all the impurities, the plays that I don't need for that particular game. And so that's kind of a three-step process we undergo as a staff um, every week to help kind of hone in, okay, here's the 24 to 28 plays we're going to go into the game with. Everyone's aligned on how they're linked together. And I think that's how you 10X a play call is you just understand the why, the intent behind the play. Right, your players and coaches. When you make a play call, everyone understands the intent of the play. Oh, Coach Maddox is anticipating cover three. That's why he's calling this pass play. Or it's you know second and ten. Um, we need to get seven yards. All right, we're going to call you know a high percentage you know read screen or whatever the case may be for that situation. They understand the intent. I think if you can get your staff and players to understand the intent behind the play call, the why it really unlocks your ability to 10x those plays. Want to take st- a step back and just talk about your workflow. And I got to the point, you know, when I was an offensive coordinator, I was doing everything so it would script out automatically for for me over the course of the week. I mean, I was meticulous about it, but I also set up this Excel spreadsheet to do it. But even though I had that call sheet then populated through that as well, I actually never went to that sheet. I still went through the process of creating that call sheet, putting everything into that call sheet, the manual process, as you said, where uh, I might not even look at some of those things during the game, but it was that exercise, that mental exercise of thinking through that. So for you, what's that, what does that workflow look like, especially as you get towards that, you know, those final days before the game of putting together that call sheet? Yeah, for us, it it always starts by formation. I mean, we're going to try to ID and build. The first step is building out the game plan via formations that we feel are going to give us the most basic looks. I mean, we're talking, and so we're, and I think when you game plan, the first part of the game plan is first and second down, right? Normal down situations, third down, red zone, goal line, all those other, you know, ancillary situations go by the wayside. We work on those once we establish you know, where that 60 to 70% of the game is played. And so we're going to try to, you know, build what's our best rhythm, strong run, rhythm, weak run, three-step, five-step RPO, whatever the case within those formations. And then we're going to then try to figure out, okay, what's the defensive adjustment going to be to take those away and then build your constraints from there. So most of our game plan process is built formationally in our R4 grids. And then after we establish those, we're then going to take all those plays and then sort them into a classification section on our play call sheet. So for example, when I look at those formations, okay, well, most of our plays out of those formations are inside zone. Well, then I'm going to take all those formations and plays and put them in my top three runs. Okay. And so that's going to be inside zone for the week and maybe it's outside zone, but I'm going to have another section where everything is broken down by classification and we have really 12 segments and so that would be like your top three rpos top three runs top three quit game top three play action and once we filter those in that auto populates our practice scripts and i know that you built one of those out keith a long time ago but that's the best thing i think i've ever done is when i feel this feel that feel this out it auto populates into the day and the section of practice and it helps me track the number of reps I'm getting. It also helps me know when I've hit my overage because we're all governed by time. I've got to make sure, you know, the plays I'm planning to call, we can rep at least once, hopefully more than once. So I think, you know, that's really the two-step process. And the final is just, is just making sure of all the plays, okay, when it hits a specific situation, what's my favorite one? So here's my top three for third and short. 
Here's my four for third and medium, third and long. And that's my, my third step process is taking those plays from the formations, from the classification, and then moving my favorite ones into those critical situation segments. And so we have a three-step process that we undergo to do that. Well, Deb, I'm I'm excited about the resource you put together. I know anytime you do this, uh, it, it's a learning process for yourself, writing, uh, putting together podcasts, putting together videos, whatever it might be. You learn along the way, but now you're going to be able to share this with coaches as well. So what's in the Art of Play Cohen course that you put together? What can coaches expect? Yeah, it's a, it's a four and a half hour course broken into 18 sections. And we talk about the the frameworks that we utilize to distill a game plan down. But but most of, of the course is built on um, how to utilize analytics and the data within situations and drive play call ideas within those. So for every situation in football that you can imagine, um, I'm going to go through some of the, the play calls that I've seen out there or the play conceptual ideas, like, for example, um, in second second 10 plus or maybe third and 10 plus. There's there's three to four really structurally some some key concepts or things that work really well in those situations. And I'm going to unpack all those ideas for you. These are some from our offense at Union, but a lot of it is is what I've identified that other teams do as well. In the NCAA, in the NFL, and so I'm going to give you ideas that you can borrow and, and utilize in your offense, or maybe it affirms some things you're already doing for those critical situations. Um, there is a 58-page uh, workbook that goes along with this course, so you'll be able to print out the PDF and make a workbook that goes along with the course to take notes. It has all the analytics and data on there, so that's something that I, that coaches have really enjoyed having that workbook um, to support it and. You own it for for your lifetime. Once you, you you purchase the product, you have it for lifetime, and you can watch it with your staff. I've watched it with my quarterbacks, and it's really helped them understand th- how critical situations are and the types of plays and the intent of play calls within those situations. So that's what you're going to get. I'm going to give you guys a, a discount code that are listening for the course. You can add it to the show notes, Keith. And uh, if you guys would check it out and support it, I really appreciate it. Well, Dub, as always, I'm excited when you put things together and teach people. I always love the way that you come about these things. I mean, you think about the game in all kinds of different ways. You draw from outside resources. And I think what you put together here, as you've said, as we pointed out in the beginning, you know, where do you go to learn this stuff? Well, now we have a place to go and learn. And and I've found uh, what you do is applicable really to any type of system. So again, thank you uh, for putting this together. Thanks for coming on the show and sharing it. And uh, look forward to talking with you more here in the future. Thanks, Keith. Always a pleasure. Here are Winning Ed's takeaways and ideas for implementation. One, understand the intent behind play calls. You should ensure that both your staff and your players understand the intent behind each call. This understanding helps unlock the potential for better execution and decision-making during games. Two, utilize analytics and data in game planning. Incorporating analytics and data into game planning processes can provide valuable insights into the key indicators that affect winning, such as explosive plays, turnover, sacks, P and 10, efficiency, and tackles for loss. You can leverage this information to make more informed plays and improve overall game day strategy. And three, structure play call sheets effectively. Developing a systematic approach to organizing play call sheets can enhance efficiency and clarity during games. By filtering plays based on formation, classification, and situation, you can streamline your decision-making process and ensure that the chosen plays align with your team's game plan and objectives. Be sure to check out the technology which Dub Maddox will be using at Union and will be part of R4, Modern Football Technology. You can find that at teammofo.com. The link is in the show notes. Dub provided a code for... 15% off his play calling course. Be sure to check the show notes for that as well. Dub will be back for season two of Accelerate Everything. That series will start in mid-June. We'll be sure to let you know when that series is starting. Follow all we're doing at coachandcoordinator.com and follow us on X at Coach K Grabowski.